So welcome everybody, delighted to see you all here. Thank you for joining uh, this webinar on, as part of the Royal Society of Chemistry series discussing chemistry and climate change. As we look forward to COP26 and the United Nations Climate Change Conference that takes place in Glasgow in November. I'm Martin Schroeder, I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Manchester and I'm chairing this, this event and I have some introductory slides as well. Uh, I will introduce our speakers in a moment and I'd like to thank the RSC, John Broderick and colleagues for their organisation. You will see on, on this slide uh, what a metal organic framework uh, is, is, looks like. It's a combination of metal centres and organic linkers linked together into a three-dimensional structure which gives you a porous material. Uh, this event will be available uh, on the RSC website, the details are, are given there. And so we're discussing a porous pl a platform of porous materials that can be varied. This is an extremely important aspect of metal organic frameworks. They're very designable. You can have small pores, larger pores. You can introduce different ligands and metalloligands inside the pores, basic groups, acidic groups. It gives you enormous chemical variety in terms of open metal sites. And of course, once you make your material, you can modify it by post-synthetic uh, means. The theme of this event is really to look at the applicability of these materials to modern problems, particularly around energy and the environment. And this builds upon a very successful Faraday discussion we had in June this year on this topic. So what you will hear today is, is details around porous materials, adsorption, storage, separation, cleanup and catalysis using metal organic frameworks targeted at the key challenges of today. Uh, net zero, carbon capture, air pollution, clean water, hydrogen power, sustainable catalysis and manufacturing. And our approach as, as, uh, as chemists, as materials engineers, we're looking at new materials by design, both in the solid and liquid phase, and looking at specific structures and targeted properties. Here are two illustrations of storage of ammonia. You can actually, using diffraction, scattering and spectroscopy, analyze in great detail the interactions of ammonia in this case as an example inside a cavity within a metal organic framework and understand these materials at a molecular level and therefore understand the function of the material or the lack of function of the material in the context of molecular sciences. We can use these for low carbon purification. In this case, is a graphic of, of purification of ethylene. And we can also look at these materials graphically. I just illustrate that here. You can actually delve into the structure. In this graphic, you can see looking at the intimate pore design and look at how, in, how the various pore walls interact with the substrates. So I'm very grateful for these uh, colleagues from around the world. Uh, I'm about to introduce Mike Zavarodko, who will talk about uh, aspects of carbon capture. Dr. Si Hai Yang, my colleague at Manchester, looking at uh, toxic gases and their capture. Omar Yagi will talk about water, water capture and, and hydrogen. Um, particular thanks to Omar who is in California, so you can work out what time of the day it is, and Natalia, who's also in the US, and Natalia will talk about photoactivation and catalysis, and then we come back to Europe with Stuart James from Queens telling us about porous liquids. So that's enough from me. I'll now hand over to Mike Zavarotko, um, who will talk about carbon capture and specific applications of MOFs uh, for the environment liquids. So that's enough from me. I'll now hand over to Mike Zavarotko, um, who will talk about carbon capture and specific applications of MOFs uh, for the environment. Uh, we're all aware that energy efficient carbon capture is a global challenge. The problem that chemists face is simple. 
Breaking up is hard to do. Uh, and neither of the two existing approaches to carbon capture, uh, shown here, physisorption and chemisorption, are optimal. Nevertheless, there are at least three companies that are actively pursuing the ultimate challenge in carbon capture, which is DAC or direct air capture. These are Global Thermostat in the USA, Climeworks in Switzerland, and Carbon Engineering in Canada. All of these approaches use chemisorption, and that means something. Uh, the term synthetic forest has actually been applied to these technologies, but it's not quite as good as it sounds. And that's because they use chemisorption, they're energy intensive, they have high energy footprints. So really they're not green unless that's the color that the DAC modules are painted in. So the solution uh, is to go physical. Let's get physical. Uh, a disruptive approach would be to, instead of using chemisorption, would be to use physisorption, uh, what we're calling regeneration optimized sorbents or ROS materials. Uh, ROS materials, uh, the first, uh, uh, retroactively uh, that we've called a ROS material is ROS1. It was reported in 2013. It set a new benchmark for CO2 N2 selectivity by an order of magnitude. This value has been surpassed in second generation ROS materials also by an order of magnitude. Selectivity is important. Uh, it's one of the three key performance parameters that define the cost of DAC along with kinetics and working capacity. Uh, when you combine these parameters, it's possible to benchmark materials. So that there is not a real benchmark for DAC because no physisorbent has been developed to high TRL levels. Nevertheless, we have something called a heat map, which allows us to look at the optimal regeneration conditions. And what you see here is that ROS41, a material ROS41, uh, has a productivity of about one kilogram of CO2 per one kilogram of ROS41 per day. Uh, also, we're able to evaluate using dynamic experiments, dynamic column breakthrough. And what you see is that ROS41 is indeed capable of capturing CO2 from air. Indeed, it reduces the CO2 concentration from 438 ppm down to less than one ppm. So I'll conclude with the vision. Now we have these tools, these ROS materials, what can we do? Well, we can do things quite differently. Uh, one of those things is uh, if you have multiple ROSs for multiple uh, uh, sorbates, such as water and CO2, which you'll hear about uh, shortly, then you can do something like self-contained farming. Uh, and in self-contained farming, the ROS does all the work for you. And in terms of the carbon footprint, uh, which can be determined uh, using economic factors, what you see is that the so-called food from air approach has a much less lower carbon footprint than conventional farming and way less than freight, air freighted uh, goods and hydroponics. Uh, so that's one vision. It's not quite C minus, but it's awfully close. Another vision is a ROS that combines DAC, uh, that is trace carbon capture with catalytic conversion into useful products such as fills and feedstocks. The pieces of this puzzle are being assembled separately, but they're already in play. So the next step is to combine them into a single material. So that's my closing message. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak and for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, very interesting. And uh, if I could uh, confirm to, to uh, uh, colleagues, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat and uh, I shall try and uh, walk and chew gum at the same time in the context of chairing and also reading out uh, the, the chat questions. And I have John Broderick from the RSC uh, making sure that I do this properly. So our next speaker is Dr. Si Hai Yang from the University of Manchester and talking about MOFs for air pollution, current and future challenges. Thank you, Si Hai. Well, thank you very, very much, Martin. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm gonna talk about the current and the future challenges of uh, air pollution. 
and how most chemistry may contribute to a solution of this problem. So as many of us all know that uh, air pollution really comes from many resources, but what may be surprising to find out is that there are over 187 different types of air pollutants. I have a list a couple of them in here, and the top five underlines are the five most significant air pollutants in the UK. And currently, according to the uh, World Health Organization, over 92% of the population on Earth is living in the polluted area. And air pollutants, they cause over 7 million premature deaths each year. Of course, many of these uh, air pollutants, they are long-lived greenhouse gas that contribute to uh, climate change, decline of uh, biodiversity, uh, and many other environmental problems. The positive side is that many countries in the world, including the UK, EU, China, and the US, have adopted legislation to fight with air pollution. So I have summarized the emission analysis of the two most toxic gaseous air pollutants, that is sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. They mainly come from the utilities and the transport. So over the past 20-25 years, MOFs has been very widely studied for absorption and the storage of gas, ranging from methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and more recently, sulfur dioxide and the nitrogen uh, dioxide. And the main problem in this field is the limited, the more, the limited stability of morphs in general up in contact with this highly corrosive and reactive gas. So in the Manchester chemistry, Martin and I have been uh, working on the development of a highly stable morph material by linking this uh, simple organic ligand and metal salt to form a range of uh, a highly robust morph for absorption of uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, and the carbon dioxide, of course. Let's take NO2, uh, which is a yellow uh, uh, pale brown uh, gas, for example. If we pass through a dirty uh, airstream with a 2000 ppm level of NO2 through this morph, what we get at the end is an ultra clean airstream with NO2 level dropped to below 0.1 uh, ppm in there. We also do a lot of X-ray uh, diffraction and nutrient diffraction and spectroscopy to analyze the complex and the dynamic host gas interaction within the pool to understand why a partic particular morph can trap so efficiently of a nitrogen dioxide. And finally, we also integrate uh, the absorption and the catalysis within the same morph bed to convert uh, air pollutant, NO2, for example, directly into a nitric acid, which is an important industry of fuel stock. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sihai. Very good. But of course, MOFs aren't only useful for capturing pollutants, and I'm delighted uh, to, to welcome Omar Yagi uh, from UC Berkeley, who has pioneered the use of MOFs for capturing water from the environment and also other substrates. Omar, please. Thank you, Martin. Uh, this is uh, a MOF, the framework uh, of the metal organic uh, structure is shown in red. And the uh, white dots that are floating around in the pore uh, are hydrogen in this case. And the idea behind MOFs, because they have an extremely high surface area, um, it could go up to 7,000 meters square per gram. Uh, so they have extremely high surface area that allows you to compact gases in the pore. And the closer these gas molecules attach themselves to the inner surface of the framework, uh, the higher their binding energy would be. So one of the really powerful things about MOFs is that not only are they, do they have crystalline structures where the pores are homogeneously distributed throughout the material, but they also, um, the chemistry allows us to go in and design the adsorptive size onto which gases such as hydrogen, carbon dioxide, as you heard, or SOXs, NOXs, could bind into the framework. And this ability to design those adsorptive sites allows you to control the binding energy. And the binding energy, the strength of the interaction between those gases and the framework is directly related to how much energy you need to uh, remove them from the pores after 
they are separated from air or another medium. So I wanted to discuss what is the state of, in this case, hydrogen storage uh, for transportation. And here the requirement is that uh, the DOE requirement, at least the initial requirement, is uh, to be able to find a material that can store five to 6% by weight at room temperature. That's equivalent to 30 kilograms per cubic meter. In fact, if you look in detail at these requirements, in, this is a requirement of a percent of the entire fueling system. So in fact, it's a lot more challenging than just five to 6% by weight of the material itself. That's 30 kilogram per cubic meter at room temperature is about uh, less than half of liquid hydrogen at 20 Kelvin. So this is what we need to be able to use hydrogen for transportation. So there are hydrogen storage materials such as alloys and chemical hydrides, which work on chemisorptive mechanism where you have a direct uh, chemical bond between the hydrogen and the material, in this case, uh, uh, requiring a lot of energy to remove that hydrogen or upon removal of hydrogen, the material may not be stable. In the case of alloys, they become uh, brittle. In the case of chemical hydrides, sometimes it's not a reversible activity. So they have, they have some uh, problems. However, adsorbance and physisorption, I agree with Mike Zawaratko, is, is an interesting uh, direction. And because you can save a lot on the energy required to remove your um, the gas molecule, in this case, hydrogen. And they are, of course, state of art materials of these reticular materials we call metal organic frameworks and covalent organic frameworks. So how far have we gotten in terms of binding hydrogen into, into MOFs and COFs? So the progress has been that the binding energy has improved uh, by increasing it from 3.5 kilojoules per mole to 13 kilojoules per mole. And keep in mind, we need to get to 20 kilojoules per mole binding energy in order to get around five or so weight percent at room temperature. So right now we're not at 20 kilojoules per mole, we are at 13 kilojoules per mole, which we obtain by uh, functionalizing the pores, exposing the metal uh, sites uh, in the pores to increase the interaction, physisorptive interaction of hydrogen to the material. That at 13 kilojoules per mole, we can get around two and a half percent by weight at room temperature. That's by weight of the material, not necessarily the fueling device. So it's it's significant percent, but it's not high enough to allow us to use hydrogen for uh, transportation yet. So more research is required here. However, so far, let's say the state of the art are structures like MOF 177 that allows you to store 12 weight percent, not at room temperature, but at 77 Kelvin. And in simple terms, what this means is that these tankers that are uh, transporting hydrogen on our highways can now, if they are filled with moth, they, you can transport double the amount of hydrogen at the same conditions that they are uh, designed to do. So again, there are uh, almost 20 gigatons of hydrogen being transported all around the world. And this is potentially an application that could be used for transporting hydrogen or for station storage. Uh, of hydrogen, where you're able by putting the MOF into the tanker, uh, you can double the amount of hydrogen that you are transporting. Even though the even though the MOF occupies volume in that tank, the compaction of hydrogen molecules into the pores allows you to store much more with the MOF than without the MOF. So that's the state of art for hydrogen. Still, we have more ideas to uh, push that frontier towards 20 kilojoules per mole and hopefully eventually get room temperature, significant room temperature storage. On the other hand, the idea of harvesting water from air, especially from arid air, is, uh, has been addressed by MOFs. So there is plenty of water in the air, almost 13,000 cubic kilometers 
uh, kilo, um, cubic kilometers, excuse me, of water in the air. That's as much, almost as much water as we have in lakes and rivers on our planet. So it's a plentiful resource, it's recyclable. So we design moths such as moth CO3 that have adsorptive sites that are designed, programmed to pluck out water from air and bring it in, bind to the hydrophilic sites, and then those sites become uh, uh, water nuclei onto which further water molecules from air bind through hydrogen bonding. We have made two prototypes and tested them in the desert. One is passive, only works on ambient sunlight, and that delivers one liter of water per day uh, for one kilogram of moth. The moth can stay in the device for up to five to six years. It's been tested over 30,000 cycles without any performance issues. So, uh, so this is one option where you have a passive device that the amount of water is proportional to the amount of moth that you use with absolutely no energy input aside from sunlight. The other prototype uh, is electrified device and that delivers around four to five liters per day. And only 200 grams of moths are deployed in that, in that device. Again, the more moth you have, the more you can deliver. So the ability to uh, store or to um, trap water from air to deliver drinking water that is clean. We've tested the water, it's clean, has no metals, no organics. And this concept, being able to store um, uh, water or deliver water from air, um, from arid atmosphere allows you to also do it in more humidified regions. So I would say that this is um, harvesting water from air anywhere in the world at any time of the year. In effect, what we're doing is we're making water available in a distributed fashion, mobile, personalized, it's pure, and hopefully we can achieve the, the vision of water independence for every person living on our planet, independent of the grid and people having their own control over their water. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Omar, uh, excellent. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Natalia Shostova from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry from the University of South Carolina, who's gonna discuss the possibilities of photoactivation uh, and catalysis by MOS. Thanks very much, Natalia. Okay, there. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, Martin, thank you so much for opportunity and the RSC for organization. It's honored to be in this session. And I want to cover the very broad area of uh, so-called photo activation of metal organic frameworks or photocatalysis. In general, it's actually all photophysical properties, which you can perform in metal organic frameworks. Here you can see the inspiration, which has actually started this uh, field. And it's, I uh, show the uh, leaf and uh, the idea was initially in the frameworks, which you can actually mimic all three processes which are occurring in the natural photosystem in metal organic frameworks. And the beauty of the morphs that you can do every free process such as light harvesting, energy transfer and photocatalysis in one platform. So that's what initial inspiration. And if I move on the next slide, you can see that this is like the, the idea behind the whole concept that uh, chromophores or dye molecules organized in the metal organic frameworks actually can be mimicking the salicoise behavior in the photosystem, in, for instance, in the leaf. And uh, not only you can organize the chromophores in pre-designed fashion and harvest the light, but you can also control the energy transfer in the system, which is extremely difficult in the many, in the many variety of other materials because you need to have precise organizations in the uh, chromophore arrangement. You need to know the distance and angle between chromophores and you actually need to promote uh, the energy transfer in the unidirectional way. 
So um, for instance, on this slide, I can show you and specify the modularity of the frameworks where you can integrate different types of photochromic moieties shown on this slide that actually promote um, energy transfer processes. All of this concept of, of turn on, turn off energy transfer in the MOFs can be applied easily in photocatalysis, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, a relative to very simplified scheme. Then on the other aspects, I want to also highlight that actually MOFs can uh, open a pathway to a variety of system and studies of framework dependent photophysics. In particular, it's a, a close by analog such as covalent organic frameworks or coughs, cages, or even DNA. So basically you can use the frameworks MOFs as a platform to extend knowledge about photophysics in general in confined space, which is a very powerful tool to uh, not only obtaining knowledge uh, in terms of fundamental knowledge, but also promote different types of applications. Here, I would like to show you the very um, simple concept. Uh, for instance, a ma majority of the frame of the um, dye molecules or different types of chromophores will behave in solution. However, they are very, how to say, useless in a solid state, which actually limit the material uh, device development. So in this case, you can use as a morph as a so-called fish tank or aquarium where you can preserve the properties of the chromophore behavior in solution, but apply them towards material design. For instance, in addition to photocatalysis, you can study frame, uh, you can use photophysics and chromophores to study um, material deterioration over time or material aging, right? So basically to study surfaces, invasive way to study surfaces using metal organic frameworks and integrated dye molecules. On another concept, which is shown on the slide, it's a very powerful what you actually can do. You can release gases on demand. And here you can see you can release nitrogen gas for just by shining light uh, on the framework with certain obviously excitation wavelength, but the general concept and general idea that on demand gas delivery through photophysical process is a very powerful concept. And finally, um, I just want to introduce the concept that you can use photophysics, not only um, photocatalytically promote advanced uh, reactions, but you can also tune the electronic properties of materials. And in this case, what is shown on the slide that they actually can connect wires or disconnect them inside of the materials as a function of external stimuli, in particular light. What actually gives you the idea in the sense that you actually not only uh, change the material properties, but you can go from the insulator to conductor. That's what the um, broad range of applications, which I want to highlight, and what is actually related to the photoactivation processes in metal organic frameworks. Thank you for your attention. And again, one more time for opportunity. Thank you very much, Natalia. Excellent. Um, let me uh, remind colleagues they can put in, their, in, in the chat any questions that they may have, uh, because after the next presentation, I'll open it up for discussion. Um, so please place your questions in, into the chat. I see Oishik Banerjee has, has posted a question for Mike Zavarotko. So uh, Mike, I think, is, is probably typing up his uh, response, but I'll hand over to Mike also to, to, to answer it. Our next speaker is, and final speaker is Stuart James from Queen's University Belfast, and he's going to tell us about carbon capture, but this time by porous liquids. So not necessarily using a solid uh, capture device, but actually using liquids, which is a very novel and interesting idea. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Martin, and thank you for the invitation to, to yourself and the RSC for taking part in this event. Um, so, uh, as Martin says, I'm going to I'm going to throw something a bit different into the mix. Forgive me, I think you need to switch your display. Ah, thank you. Are we good now? Yep, lovely. Yep. Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, so. We're seeing beautiful examples of new solid state structures, you know, presented here as well, you know, some fantastic examples. Um, 
something which is a little bit more counterintuitive is, is how you get that really useful functionality of the porosity, not just in the solid state, but in the liquid state. Now, why would you want to do this apart from just the, you know, the curiosity and the, the challenge of controlling liquid structure that way? But there are some real potential advantages in doing this in terms of technology. And a simple thing is that you can pump liquids through pipes. And that means you can have a cyclic system which separates gases, okay, based on your liquid absorbent. So, you know, it picks up a mix, uh, it's exposed to a mixture of gases at one point, uh, it selectively picks up one of those gases, it moves to another point, and then you can release it by changing the temperature or the pressure. So there are some real engineering advantages in being able to get porosity into the, the solid state. And the, what the porosity gives you is selective capture of particular gases. And you know you can't pump solids through pipes very easily, but you can with liquids. So um, let me give you, I hope what is a really simple illustrative uh, example of this, and it relates obviously you know, straight to uh, uh, climate change, and, and that is carbon capture. So carbon capture is already used uh, in a number of processes, for example, the sweetening of natural gas, which comes out of the ground as a mixture of methane and carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide has to be separated out. Uh, for biogas as well, you have to separate carbon dioxide. Ultimately, we would like to be able to separate carbon dioxide and trap it from, from you know, power plants. That hasn't really been done very successfully yet. And in the meantime, also there is the challenge of blue hydrogen, which uh, creates a mixture of hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So and now there are ways then in principle to trap CO2. The most mature technologies are based on liquid solvents. So these are either uh, chemical uh, reactions that happen between the CO2 and the solvent, that can be amines, or they can be physical solvents like polyethers, and trade names for these are genosorb and selexol. And I'll come back to genosorb in a second. There are issues with all of these. Um, you know, the amines, uh, they're extremely energy hungry. Uh, I think generally people regard that this is simply not practical at large scales. The amount of energy which is needed is just off the scale. Um, the genosorb type solvents, they don't have a huge capacity for CO2. So there are things that can be done to improve the technology there. So the question is, um, can you incorporate porosity straight into these types of materials and improve their properties that way. And yes, you can. And these materials are called porous liquids. So this is an idea proposed back in 2007. Um, and, uh, you know, since then it has now, this has become a, a recognized class of, of liquid absorbents. Um, just very briefly then, so this was the, this was the state of the, of the field back in 2007. We were the only group working on them. Now it has become a, a very much a, a multinational endeavor and uh, it's uh, really sort of forming a field in its own right. So on to a simple example then. Um, there are, you know, uh, there are some uh, very subtle, intricate ways to make porous liquids if you want to control molecular structure. But the most practical and the simplest and the most economical way to do it is you take a liquid and you disperse into that liquid a microporous solid such as a moth or it could be a zeolite, something like that. And you get something which now looks like milk because you have particles now of the microporous solid in there. And this example here is really neat because the liquid that we use is already used to separate CO2 from other gases. And that liquid is this commercial solvent called genosorb. It's a polyether. And so it has a limited CO2 capacity. What we do is, in this case, we take a zeolite, but it could potentially be a moth. We take a zeolite, which has a high CO2 capacity, and we simply disperse that into that liquid. And now we've got a porous liquid, which has boosted CO2 capacity. A key aspect of this, though, is that you have to be certain that the liquid molecules, the genosorb molecules, cannot get into the pores of the zeolite. If that happens, then you've lost the function of the zeolite. So there is a trick to this. You have to make sure that the zeolite or the moth remains empty when it's in the liquid state, then it can absorb huge amounts of CO2. 
Um, so, as I say, you can pump liquids through pipes. Uh, this is, uh, these, are, these are results from a cyclic separation. We start off with a mixture of methane and carbon dioxide. This is mimicking biogas. Uh, and in, in the graph there, you can see basically red represents the methane, blue represents the carbon dioxide, and the left there you see the feed gas coming in, that's representing the biogas. What you want is a process that can remove the CO2. Uh, the genosorb, uh, the, the standard industrial solvent, after one pass through the system, uh, removes just uh, uh, you know, two, three percent of that CO2. But you can see on the right there, uh, the effect of using a porous liquid, which has a much higher capacity for CO2, that is removing a lot more of it. So basically, CO2 hungry liquids. Um, Techno-economic analysis suggests that this could save 20 to 30 percent in terms of the operational costs of a biogas treatment uh, setup. Also, what's important about this is what I mentioned before. These systems are up and running using liquids but they're not always as efficient as we need them to be. Uh, these porous liquids are potential drop-in replacements for existing uh, solvents. So there isn't a huge barrier to actually implementing these. So in terms of the future of porous liquids, it's a young field, but it is developing very rapidly. Um, I think in terms of climate change and sustainability, I think there is a huge opportunity now to, to try and uh, implement these drop-in replacements for existing solvents. And that could be initially in small markets like biogas, but then we have the, the big issue of blue hydrogen, which looks set to become part of the uh, part of the uh, UK um, you know, strategy towards eventually green hydrogen. But subsequently, bear in mind that there are huge other opportunities here for reducing the carbon footprint of chemical separations generally. So ethane and ethene separation of these two gases is done cryogenically because there has never been a solvent that can separate them. So, and this takes huge amounts of energy. Estimates are that it's about half a percent of the whole of the US energy demand that goes on this one chemical separation. Can we do that more efficiently if we generate porous liquids, basically liquid solvents that are selected for one gas over the other? I believe we can. And so I think there's a very exciting future for liquid porous materials. And with that, I will stop. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, uh, Stuart. Um, please do post your questions uh, into the chat. Um, just to summarize some, some key features here, we can clearly see that MOFs are highly stable or can be extremely stable and, and uh, can be used under very demanding conditions. We have examples of scale up. Um, and the issues of making sufficient MOF to actually be technologically viable. Th this, of course, remains a challenge, but is being solved. We also have, as Stuart pointed out, we need to replace highly energy efficient processes by new processes that are much more energy efficient. So I have a question from Oishik Banerjee to Mike about his ROS materials. Um, Oshik is very interested in, in the, how to get how to make fuels and chemicals. How far away are we from doing this? Could we be, could we be making fuels from air by 2040? What stands in the way, Mike? And of course, I'd open it up to other colleagues as well uh, to, to comment on this general question, which I think is very important. Mike. Uh, thank you, Martin. And thank you, Oshik. I, I did type a response because he used the magic words for me, fill from air, <laughs> you know, the, uh, and uh, when I first moved uh, to uh, Ireland in 2013, my very first proposal was titled fill from air, but it wasn't the same process. It was uh, direct air capture coupled with, with genetically modified algae. So it was a combination of two technologies, one which was nascent and one which was already known. Uh, and uh, it didn't get funded, <laughs> but we're actually still excited about the concept. Food from air and fill from air, the starting point is capture of CO2. And most processes don't work well at 430 ppm, including nature, right? So the leaves, don't work that well at carbon capture. It's hard to capture CO2 in humid air 
at 430 ppm. So, so my answer basically uh, is that it largely depends on whether you have a commercial pole and you can meet the cost requirements for scale up and making a product that is less expensive than what's already out there. So at this point, it's driven by the commercial realities. Uh, personally, I think that the food from air could already be done because it's piggybacking upon things like hydroponics, but doing them uh, by not relying on mains electricity and water supplies and CO2 being uh, piped in uh, from a tank, a cylinder. Uh, so that is already something that could be field tested. I think the, the dream of uh, combining photocatalysis or catalytic conversion with carbon capture uh, is something that has all the pieces in place, but is a bit further away from something beyond the lab. So I think we can demonstrate all the pieces in the lab, but we're a long way from uh, having an industrial process that, that got, takes us there. Thank you. Could I ask Natalia and perhaps Omar to comment on particularly CO2 utilization, photocatalytic conversion into new fuels, for example, CO2 to methane, if you wish. No obligation to respond. Yeah, I mean, I'm listening to these nice uh, talks that we just uh, um, saw, and uh, I'm I'm thinking that maybe um, we're we're what the MOFs are enabling, and what reticular chemistry, the chemistry of manipulating these, not just making them, but manipulating them on a molecular level. What, what it's pointing to is perhaps an air economy, the economy that is based on air, clean air, clean fuels, and clean water, all, all from air. So you have uh, air is a free and plentiful resource, and it needs to be cleaned. And, uh, and as just was mentioned, the CO2 that you can um, get from the air can be converted uh, to a fuel, that fuel could be combined with hydrogen from water splitting or from water that you've already harvested from air and split to produce hydrogen and combine it with CO2 to make uh, starting materials that you can then feed a microorganism, specially engineered to make fuels and molecules from pharmaceuticals to other important molecules and even even enzymes. So, so I, I would say that um, that's not uh, uh, far-fetched. I think the components are working already. We have very good idea of how to capture CO2 from air. Um, and we have very good idea on how to produce, let's say, acetate by combining that with uh, CO2 with hydrogen. And Already it has been demonstrated and there are commercial entities that are already producing fuels from microorganisms and molecules and pharmaceuticals from microorganisms. So we need a way to integrate these three. Um, I've already demonstrated how you can take water out of air from arid air down to 10% relative humidity. And, and that type of material can work anywhere, not just in the arid regions, but also in regions that are more watered, but yet the water may not be clean, okay? That's not just for drinking, as, as Mike pointed to, you can, you can use it for what's called vertical farming to control the humidity within, the, within that, those compartments, within those farms uh, that are sealed farms. And, and control the quality of food so and the amount of food. So, so I think what I wanted to point out, there is, a, there's a, there is some convergence, I would say, towards um, envisioning an air economy that is enabled by reticular chemistry and by materials such as those that we, we just, we just um, heard about. Thank you, Omar. Very good. And Natalia, do you have any comments, particularly about photoactivation uh, of, of CO2 and other substrates? 
So um, I completely agree with uh, Professor Yagi. So in this regard, because the modular here is, is actually we have all the modular pieces. If we talk about photo activation in the sense that we would like to be efficient as like photo system, we are not there yet for sure. But what maybe we don't need to be because we just need to have like the speed of the material in the same, like how to say, it. we need to um, expect the outcomes, like basically that's what we are interested in. And uh, in terms of the photo system and photo activation, we right now, like we um, most beautifully can harvest the light in variety of region of a solar spectrum as it was shown for a while already. The question is how to uh, move this uh, basically harvested energy into the unidirectional way or pre-designed pathway. That's a challenge to the reaction center, right? So that's what the piece which we, uh, a lot of people work on. But I think like in general, for a general overview, I think we have pieces, but we need to very nicely integrate them into one, right? So free in one platform, that's a, that's a goal. Thank you, thank you. There are two questions for Stuart, um, which I'll combine. One is, is, are the porous liquids reusable? And then there is a question, um, uh, what requirements are there for adding solid sorbents to the liquid suspensions? Is there a particular particle size distribution, which is an interesting question, uh, or surface properties that are needed? And what are the general barriers for, for taking known moths with high selectivity and making a porous liquid from it? Stuart. You're on mute. Those famous words. You're on mute. I should be used to hearing that by now. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Um, yes, they they are uh, reusable because essentially what we are dealing with is physisorption. Uh, so, you know, if you take the example of the CO2, the interaction is about 30 kilojoules per mole, something of that nature. Uh, and it's very similar to the binding, or, you, know, the, you know, the energy of dissolution in, in one of those uh, basic solvents. So, so what you find is that you can actually take out the CO2 under the similar sorts of conditions as you would for, for taking it out of the solvent. And we've cycled a few times around some of these ones. Some are easier than others. I would say that basically, if you if it's some, if it is if it does rely on physical binding, then there's nothing to stop you taking it out. And the kinetics are quite fast as well. We started looking at that now. Um, I, I did wonder if the kinetics was going to be the killer here because you've got diffusion through the liquid, then you've got to get diffusion into the particles. But it looks like diffusion through the particles is faster possibly than through the liquid. It certainly doesn't seem to slow it down much. Um, so the other question was about what, um, sorry, Martin, it was about what solids the, can the, be the dispersed. Particle size distribution or surface yeah. properties that are needed. Okay, so both are important. Um, if, uh, you know, uh, intuitively, uh, you know, and as, as, as with, you know, all dispersions, generally speaking, the smaller the particles, the more stable your dispersion is going to be to sedimentation or indeed flotation because you maximize the, you know, the, the surface area with the, in contact with the solvent. Um, and so that's something that we consider as well. Um, we, you know, very interested in particularly in moths or zeolites where you can actually easily make a range of particle sizes. So if you need to make the small ones, you can do that. Um, also the, the surface interactions with the solvent, these are key as well. Um, and so you, you can do, so if, for example, you can take, uh, oh, silicone oils are, are, are a very interesting liquid medium to disperse things into because silicones are just so, so cheap and you have all sorts of different variants. Um, you can get methylated silicone oils and you can get ones with aromatic groups on and generally speaking for example the aromatic group ones tend to disperse things better presumably because you have uh, stronger interactions um, and you can th there's also the option of additives as well so you can put in surfactants or you know things that bind to the surface um, not even necessarily particularly strongly you don't know it's not really sort of chemical modification you're just adding in something that can bind weakly to the surface of the moth or the zeolite and it can also then bind into the solvent and improve the dispersion that way. Okay there's a quick question here from Mike as well so panelists are asking you questions is the cost saving for porous liquids based upon inherent carbon capture performance or because of the continuous nature of the process so that's already an engineering question because of course many yeah. much of the cost going to your example of ethylene once you, you still have a huge cost associated with some of these separations. 
Yeah, so so certainly with the second part of that question, that is down to the engineers. Um, but uh, that, that particular example of cost saving, that is, as far as we can, sort of comparing like for like, it's taking a setup that already works based on a Genazorb type solvent, comparing that to our porous liquid, which is, you know, is basically just a zeolite dispersed into the Genazorb. And it's assuming, you know, that it's a drop-in replacement that you don't need any engineering changes, which you think might be possible. Um, so it's really comparing like for like there. Uh, um, now, but if you wanted to go from, you know, these cyclic ones based on liquids to the sort of wheels based on the solids, again, that, that's one for the engineers. Uh, the devil is always in the detail there. Um, uh, if that sort of thing can be applied to the CO2 capture using solids, I, I simply don't know for the moment. Yeah. Well, we have the same also in with solid state MOFs, the, the engineering, the pelletization and the processing of those materials are, are very important in their overall function. So thank you, Kay Yassin, for the, for the question and for anonymous yeah. attendee. I don't know whether it's the same anonymous attendee, but it's wonderful it, on Zoom that colleagues can, can ask questions and not necessarily um be embarrassed or, or or they feel more comfortable about doing it on chat so this is a good thing about uh zoom so it's a it's a it's a question for omar uh clearly uh anonymous attendee knows about moths because they realize that they can be flexible so flexible moths are, are a very important uh sub area of, of this and this this is really about uh, is it possible to use them for hydrogen storage? And then I would go to to see how and really ask also about ammonia because ammonia is is a uh, is a portal for hydrogen, and clearly there is there are other ways of of transporting hydrogen, not as simply as hydrogen itself, but as in this case ammonia. So Omar and then see Uh Sure, flexible frameworks have been uh, demonstrated to be very useful in. Uh, uh, controlled release, let's say, of gases and holding on to gases and releasing them uh, by gated mechanisms and things like that. There's a lot of literature on that. Um, many of my colleagues uh, around the world have been working on that. With hydrogen, especially, you need the, the real challenge is really the binding energy. So you need a way to increase that binding energy without increasing it to be too high above 20 kilojoules per mole, as I mentioned. And releasing hydrogen is not very difficult because it's held in the pore by, uh, by, by physisorptive interactions. So, um, so I would say they're interesting class of materials, uh, intriguing in terms of controlled release of, of gases and separations. I think for hydrogen, you need to watch that binding energy and that's and produce um, a MOF or um, a construct of um, uh, complex MOFs, maybe combination of nano particles and MOFs to increase the, the binding energy. I think for ammonia, I just want to comment that uh, with coughs back in 2010, we showed that you can store uh, you know, exceptional amounts of ammonia. In fact, I think it was a record. I have to check back, but I think it was at least double what you can store with amber light and other state-of-the-art materials because with the cough, with those particular coughs, you, um, there were uh, boron atoms making up the framework and they're, of course, uh, Lewis acidic and, and ammonia is Lewis basic. And so that interaction uh, allows you to store a lot, of, a lot of ammonia. We have a demonstration of a, a cough pellet that a student held in, in his hand at the time that is fully impregnated with ammonia. And that tells you that not just can you store large amounts of ammonia, but also it can be held into the pore at room temperature so, that, so, you know, there's also a st uh, not just storage, but also a safety uh, transport issue yeah. that, you. that you can overcome these solids. Yeah. So I see hi. You can say more, I'm uh, sure, about this. Uh, just to add on this. So, uh, indeed, um, the importance of uh, ammonia, I guess there's a little point to highlight on this. It's being uh, made in uh, astronomical scale around the world. And the beauty of uh, ammonia synthesis is that this can be produced locally in the large quantity 
and therefore the CO2 produced in this process can be uh, recycled and converted uh, locally as well. So because of its very high uh, gravimetric uh, density of hydrogen, so this is uh, widely considered as a green energy source because upon the combustion, we get a harmless water and the dinitrogen. So this is uh, promising. And uh, my view in, uh, in, uh, in uh, contribution, potential contribution of morphs towards ammonia could be the storage uh, for mid, uh, mid distance and the long-term distance transport of ammonia. Ammonia is of course quite corrosive and reactive, and therefore the design of a highly robust and then modify the morph could be uh, important. And uh, we have been uh, uh, indeed focusing on the, on the modification of the poor structure of morphs because ammonia is, uh, is uh, a basic gas, a simple uh, chemi chemi uh, chemical modification could be designed morphs with uh, acidic poor environments, which we recently achieved uh, near, uh, near, near liquid to solid storage density of ammonia within the morph pool at entirely ambient conditions. So this is going to be important for its transport. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'm always struck as something I didn't re really know that in the 1930s, 1940s, there were ammonia coaches, ammonia buses uh, in the UK. I, I'm assuming they, they must have been in North America as well, but I, I was unaware of this, to be honest. Um, and, you know, they were testing ammonia as, a, as an alternative fuel source for um, be, be, be because of the war. Um, I have another question here for, for all the panelists. If we can go quickly, quickly round, what is, from your perspective, the single biggest challenge that MOFs might be able to solve, be part of, particularly in the context of the COP26 conference in November? And certainly, what do you think MOFs could achieve in terms of the various discussions that will obviously take place within the climate change program. I'll go quickly, swiftly through the panel. One key area that you think MOFs could really deliver something of benefit to mankind. Mike. Well, uh, I'm not used to going first. It's not the story of my life, but thank you. Uh, if I had to pick the one that will have the most immediate impact, it's water harvesting and purification. I think it's, it's an urgent need uh, and there's no plan B. <laughs> you know, if there's water, you don't last long without water. And it's just a, a growing problem around the world. The CO2, I think, is almost more political than anything else. It requires incentives and investment, industrial investment. But I, I would pick the water harvesting as the one that we will see in, in five to 10 years or less. Thank you, Natalie. Natalia, sorry, Natalia. Either way is fine. So um, I think like it's very strange to say, especially in front of the experts here. Yeah, I agree with uh, Mike about water. I also think like the beauty of morphs, I don't want to single out the problem, right? And the key point, like we already have a lot of successful startups or even companies regarding this. So like i fascinating about like how uh, quickly and nicely you can do capture water, right? It's just, it's like, it's, there is no, like it's already working. So even if we, if I say like something else, I just, um, how to say, we'll be in position say like, let's say CO2 or sequestration, which is extremely important, but we already have a technology which was demonstrated nicely um, uh, by uh, Professor Yagi that it's actually working already. Right, so I, I would vote, my vote goes to water capture and the production, right, in this. Especially, I was fascinated by the talk when you can actually can uh, capture water in uh, deserts, right, in does matter humidity. It's amazing from my point of view. And it's very hard, to be honest, to beat it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Omar, you're not allowed to say water. <laughs> All right, then. Um... <laughs> Uh, well, we solved we solved we solved the natural gas um, storage challenge, right? And that's fifty percent cleaner than petroleum, and you have to go in steps to wean ourselves off petroleum. Uh, but definitely water. We have plenty of it in the air. Yeah. Technology works. It's been tested over thirty thousand cycles. You can drink the water, 
So it's a no brainer. The world needs water, not just the one in the desert, but also in the water region. I just want to step back and just make two remarks. One, one is that, you know, the advance of civilization has always really tracked with the materials that people deployed during those periods. You know, we have the Stone Age, the Brass Age, the Iron Age, the Glass Age, the Plastics Age. And I really think that in the 20th century, we entered the molecular age, and that has led to pharmaceuticals and the improvement of people's lives. But I think we're entering what I call the reticular age, where a material that you can imagine, you make. You go to the lab and you make it. Not only has it mobilized the youth to enter into this uh, endeavor, but also it's a worldwide activity. And the second point that I want to make is that the chemistry is really at the heart of solving problems. And society has never had a technical problem where our will to solve that problem was there and we didn't solve it. We always solve problems where we have the will to solve them and the resources are put in that direction. So the, 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 the last point I want to make is that in the water harvesting problem, we learned something amazing, and that is the tiny changes that you make in your framework in the MOF material that you and I as chemists consider trivial, yanking out a nitrogen, putting an oxygen there, make a humongous difference in the performance of the device. For example, a 20,000 liter device that could water a village with just a tiny change like I was just mentioned, could add 3,000 liters. That's, that's 3,000 more people can have a drink a day just because I, I, I change a nitrogen with an oxygen and, and therefore change the binding energy of water and the energy efficiency and productivity of water at the end of the performance. That's, that's what we're doing in this chemistry. We're connecting the molecular level understanding and control to the performance of the device. And in many of our labs, we're doing this in just in our labs. We're no longer just chemists. We have become engineers that reckon with airflow, with energy transport, with, mat with mass transport. So, so yes, my vote goes for water and for the control that we have in MOFs to solve many other problems. Thank you, Omar. But in the interest of time, just briefly, Stuart, and then see hi. Right, re really quickly, Martin, I don't know. Uh, what, about what I would offer, I, a couple of thoughts on that. The devil is always in the detail. And you can have a material that works and it can be tremendously exciting. But if it's going to find its way all the way to a full scale application, it's got to make sense at every scale, you know. And um, my thoughts would be, I mean, I, I do think there's something, there's something here. I think we're going to see some applications coming. I just don't know what they're going to be. I think early engagement with engineers and people actually at the hard face who, who are dealing with the industrial problems. Uh, this is, uh, this is really, really important, I think. Thank you. See, hi. Thank you. Well, I think MOF will have a bright future in terms of uh, development of a clean air. Uh, future and sustainable manufacture and also to aid the transport and storage of uh, chemicals for long distance such as ammonia. I think the, the next step forward, or, or, or one of the biggest challenges in the field is always that we need to gain deeper and more knowledge in terms of the chemistry happening within the pool and therefore we can design better new materials. Thank you. Thank you. Um... One further comment from me, just as a closure, I've always been struck that chemists underestimate one key thing that we all do, and that is we're able to target a molecule, but not only are we able to make the molecule, but we can make billions and billions and billions of those molecules, and they are all identical. And so therefore we have a capacity to engineer materials in the same way uh, to scale. Um, time is up. We're, we're, we're slightly over. I hope that that's okay. Um, I'd just like to thank the panelists very, very much indeed for their time and their efforts. I'd also like to thank um, all the, the audience and all the, all the, all the people who've, who've, who've attended this. It's, it's great to see you all here. 
You can find more about Royal Society of Chemistry discussions around the UN's COP26 programme on the RSC website, which is rsc.li slash COP26. Uh, I'm sure you can find that. It's also available on social media. And there are a variety of series of, of, of events uh, on that website. Just remains for me. Oh, yes, John has just put this up uh, on the chat. So that's the that's the link for these discussions. Again, thank you very much indeed. I found this really very, very stimulating. Uh, thank you uh, to, to everybody and see you again sometime, somewhere, I hope very soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. The chemical sciences are at the heart of sustainability solutions. Sustainability, powered by chemistry. <laughs>